to the part that's most fun for me, which is to ask all of you your views on what we talk about all the time, almost all day long, in every segment that I think most Americans are so concerned about right now. And that is, what is going to happen on January 1st, 2013? What is, going, what is going to happen when we reach the end of the spending cuts and the tax cuts? What's going to happen to this fiscal cliff that's looming? How worried are you about it, Sheila? Well, I, uh, I actually, my fear is that they will just kick the can down the road again, that they'll just extend all the, you know, the, the tax cuts uh, on the payroll side, on the uh, unemployment benefits, the whole thing. And they'll kick the can down the road for those six months or 12 months. And every time they do that, it costs a lot of money. It adds a lot to the deficit, and, and we don't fix anything. So I don't. I actually don't think they'll take us over the fiscal cliff. I think the real danger is that they will just continue on, bubble on the way we've been doing, which is really unsustainable, and they won't start making the hard decisions that really need to be made to get us back on a, a path of fiscal sustainability. Well, Mel, you know, there was a study that came out by the Wall Street Journal that looked at what small business owners and what CEOs, what they think, and how likely will we go over the fiscal cliff. 47% said they thought at least for some period of time that might happen. What do you think? You know, I think that it begins before January 1st. I think it begins on November 7th, which is like the day <laughs> after the election. And I think at that point, there's going to be a tremendously concerted effort to try to do some things during the lame duck session to set up a better situation going into 2013. So first of all, I agree with Sheila. I don't think we will go over the fiscal cliff. Uh, but I think more hopeful than Sheila that they just can't kick the cane down the road. And I've been talking to some of my former colleagues, and there's a real sense of seriousness among, uh, they tell me it's as many as perhaps 40 or 45 senators on a bipartisan basis that are really serious about dealing with this problem in a serious sort of way. Um, a lot is going to depend on the election, and by that I mean the contours of what kind of a deal they might make. I think it depends an awful lot on the outcome of the election. There's probably two or three ways in which they may go depending on you know, Republican House, Democrat Senate, who's in the White House. I mean, it just, there's about three or four ways in which this all can sort itself out. But nonetheless, I think there will be a real effort to deal with a lot of this before the, during the lame duck, before the end of the year. And if I had to forecast, I would say they even would make a significant down payment in order to move sequestration off for six months, but put a significant down payment of several trillion dollars during the lame duck. That's my take. Karen, do you see this as a November 7th problem more that so then, or something that you're thinking about for then not waiting until you can't wait as well, money I, manager? I think November 7th, if we have a very significant mandate from one side or the other, that, that will be an interesting point. I fully agree with Sheila. I think that it will be a kick the can, sadly. I think that having seen how badly the markets around the world reacted last summer to what was high noon politics, and uh, uh, I don't think there was an understanding of how badly the markets would react. Nobody came out better served from that, so I don't think we'll see a replay of that. It's interesting, though, that we're here at a dinner like this where you have uh, you know, the leaders of our country and the leaders around the world playing kick the can, as if that gets rid of the can, mm -hmm. which it doesn't, right. um, while we try to teach our children on a very micro level yes. about saving and spending. It's, it's a different, interesting dichotomy there. Yeah. What do you think, Scott? What do you think is going to happen, and how does the NYSC kind of position itself in, in light of all the different scenarios that, as Mel said, it could, could take place? Well, first of all, I have to obviously uh, say Duncan sends his, re his regrets. Uh, he's at a board meeting of ours in, in Amsterdam, so I'm proud to obviously represent him in the exchange uh, on, this, on this panel with the other honorees. Uh, in terms of the fiscal cliff, I think, you know, uh, we've been talking to a lot of CEOs. We've done a lot of survey work, trying to gather opinion, to gather consensus. And actually, it's very interesting. They certainly, there's certainly a lot of concern about the election results and what impact it might have and what might happen with the fiscal cliff issue. The reality is people are actually pretty optimistic and their predictions for what might happen next year in terms of growth, corporate growth, actually pretty positive, more positive than we've seen in the last few years. So we're actually quite encouraged by the, uh, the input that we see from CEOs. And you know, we had an interesting group at the exchange uh, today actually doing the opening bell, Fix the Debt, the Fix the Debt organization. Mm -hmm. 
people are absolutely uh, you know, very interested in solving the problems that we have on a nonpartisan basis, and we're just happy to be a platform to help them express that. And uh, you know, I think uh, we have sunnier, sunnier uh, days ahead. Karen, as, as a money manager, as an investor, how do you position yourself, though, when, when, as Mel mentioned, there could be easily three different scenarios or even more. When I talk to business leaders and CEOs, they're, they're, they're paralyzed almost by knowing which way to turn because there are so many possibilities out there. So what do you do? Uh, as it turns out, I haven't done it well this, this <laughs> month. But, um, <laughs> but I tr you know, it's interesting that um, these markets that we, we have now are just so correlated to the macro events, and it is very difficult to be a value investor, which is what we try to do um, when everything is just uh, based on the macro picture. So we try to have a longer term view. I, I'm ultimately very optimistic on the US economy, and so I want to have positions that reflect that, but I have to be hedged in the short term and it, it's, it's a tough time for money managers because well, what do I know about Spain's deficit? Nothing, pretty much, uh, except that it's very big. But other than that, I really don't know much about it, but I do have to have hedges in my, por my portfolio. It's a lot of noise and it's a lot of uh, wasted effort, uh, but you need to do it anyway. It's, a di it's difficult markets to navigate. Is it, is it, Mel, is it deferring economic activity in your view, because there is so much uncertainty about Europe, so much uncertainty about China, so much uncertainty about the U.S., and, and what kind of impact is that having, maybe in the short term, certainly, but in the longer term? There's no question that the uncertainty, really for the last couple of years, has created a tremendous drag on economic growth, in my opinion, and corporate investment. I mean, you have to look at the substantial balance sheets of America's corporations today to know that somebody's holding on to their cash and trying to figure out how this all is going to sort out. You know, when you talk to people in the healthcare industry, they want to know, is the healthcare law going to remain or not? Obviously, it depends on November 6th to a great extent. But even then, uh, you know, which way is it going to go? So to the extent we can eliminate uncertainty and begin to give solid direction to the country, I think that really is helpful. And obviously, the, the election will be a, a signal of sorts. Uh, no matter which way it goes, I think at least we'll know. And, and by the way, my hope, and I think, uh, I remain here with the, the guys being the optimist here, I think, is the way we sorted it out. But uh, uh, I, I remain very optimistic that with, it, with an election, we'll have a period of time where the people where I used to work that are not thought of as uh, having the vision to look beyond the next election will take a period of time and you know, stop the eternal campaign and really deal with some of these problems because I think there is a recognition that they're really serious. Do you see in the, any surveys that, that have been done with the NYSC that business leaders are actually feeling the same way? I mean, what do you, what do you see in what you're... Well, I, as I said earlier, I think there definitely is a, you know, a significant amount of concern among CEOs and leaders of corporate America about the position that we're in and, and where we're headed. I, I do agree that regardless of the result of the election, we're going to get through it. And I think they're optimistic about next year and then the level of growth that we'll see here in the U.S. And interestingly, they're also very uh, happy with the level of growth they're, they're actually seeing in countries like China and, and places where even though growth has slowed, there's still a lot of optimism there. Even if we don't see, Sheila, the can kick down the road, um, the issues that are facing right. in Europe, right. the issues that we're facing in so many places right. may be paramount to what even we're facing here. How right. do you, what do you see as the perhaps long-term impact in that way? Well, I, I think the long-term impact is even more uncertain than that. The, there's just uncertainty everywhere. Uh, and and the, the unfortunate thing about this is a lot of the problems are caused here and in Europe with political dysfunction. Uh, we, there, these are times government needs to step up to the plate. They have some difficult decisions to make. They need to make them, and they need to execute on those decisions. I just think if we get in this lame duck, they can make one big decision, whether it's corporate tax code or, or entitlement spending, or just pick one. Make some decisions. Make it responsible. Go out there. Defend it to the public give them hope that our government, there's somebody in charge here in Washington, we do have leadership, well, I'm serious, uh, just that the government can function. I think that in and of itself would, would really buttress uh, whatever small amount of optimism we have right now. Uh, but the, the, we have the same problem in Europe. I mean, there, and it, these problems do not get better with time. They get a lot worse with time. And the longer they, uh, 
delay uh, coming to grips with the very serious fiscal problems, uh, the harder it's going to be to get things done. I don't know how many investors or perhaps retail investors might think this, but in terms of some of the market participants that I've talked to, mm -hmm. they say we have these political problems here, we have the crisis in Europe, we have the concerns about growth from China, and then we have regulations here on, t on top of on top everything of it, yeah. that are even hindering us more. So are we shooting ourselves in yeah. the foot here? Well, I, I think we need to be smart about regulation, especially in financial services. We need more effective regulation. We need a more robust regulation. We're getting more regulations. I'm not sure there's, that it's more effective. And, and I am disappointed in Dodd-Frank implementation that the regulations that are coming out, they're delayed. When they do come out, they're very long, very complicated, riddled with exceptions. People are not sure what benefit you're getting from them. We can see a lot of compliance costs. I think regulators uh, need to get smarter about it. Uh, we, we need you know things like just having stronger capital standards, constraining leverage, constraining the amount of money large financial institutions can use that, to, to borrow money to fund their operations versus how much shareholder equity has to be used to fund operations. Things simple like that could go a long way to promote financial stability. And I know a lot of financial institutions don't want to do that, but you know it's, it's, you know, the, it's, it's a simple metric. It's easy to enforce. Uh, but instead, we get very long, complicated rules. And again, people, you, you see these long rules. They're hard to understand. There are all these exceptions. You're not sure what benefit you're getting. And there are a lot of administrative costs. So, but financial regulation is the one area where the polls show people support more regulation. But it needs to be more effective regulation. It needs to be smart. It needs to be prioritized to, to target the problems that we know were a problem leading up to the 2008 crisis. You know, one of the things that, and one of the reasons why I've been so happy that I've been involved with CE over the years is that I see the financial crisis that we went through and what I see continuing mm -hmm. around the world as an opportunity, mm -hmm. as a real opportunity. But it also is a real challenge now to explain to our children what they have to look forward to, yeah, what's know. going to happen. So I want to ask each of you, and I think this might be helpful for the educators in the room to give them some talking points. How would you explain to a high school student today, a middle school student today, what they can expect in terms of their uh, economic future when they're getting ready to go to college or into the workforce? All right. Well, I, 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 w I wish I could paint it a more optimistic picture, but I, I just see uh, we still have, fortunately, consumers are delivering still and institutions are delivering, but the, con the, the, the government is not. They're levering up. And uh, all of these, these benefits and defense spending and all of it is, is being uh, paid for with borrowed money, a significant portion of it. And we're, we're loading that debt on our kids. And uh, you know, I, it saddens me. I have a, a college-age son, and he and his friends are absolutely convinced there will not be Social Security for them. They think they're going to pay for my Social Security and yours, but they don't think they're, they're going to have it. They just see it as an economic burden. There, there's, there's not any hope there. And as a mother, I hate that. And I, you know, I just wish Washington and the public that votes these people uh, into office would think longer term. And we can't sustain uh, the entitlement programs we have without benefit cuts or, uh, or tax increases. And the longer it goes, uh, the more the burden it's going to put on my son and his expectation and those of his friends are going to be right. So we need to, when I left the FDIC, I, I did an op-ed in the, in the Washington Post about short-termism how short-termism had been such a driver of the crisis, and that it con continues to drive the lack of, of bold decision-making and leadership that will get us on a sustainable path, not just for us, but for our kids. You're already doing at the NYSC with your virtual tour, with the, you have groups in all the time, so I'm sure that there are at least two talking points that may be a little bit more optimistic yeah, that, you're so. telling, that you're telling students when they come in. What are you saying? I guess I'm one of the optimists here uh, <laughs> on the stage tonight. You know, we do a great job at the exchange with uh, a lot of talented people who put a lot of work and effort into creating programs for kids and for teachers, and we've actually done a lot with, with uh, this organization to, to help with those teacher workshops. And there happens to be a lot of those people here tonight. I'm going to do a little, something a little unusual. I want to recognize the two NYSE tables. These are the people doing this every day who are teaching students who are constantly coming through and they're teaching and working with teachers to help teach uh, the students as well. I'm going to recognize the two tables. I see Steve Wheeler, who's the head of the NYSE Foundation. And I know we have another table right here. I can see Camille. And I know there's others from the floor community who are here who also help. So thank you. Good to have you here. They do a thank fabulous you. job of doing this. And we get a lot you. of help. Karen, what are you going to say? I know you have kids like me. What do you, what do you say I, to them? I do. I have four kids, and I thought, of course, I'm teaching them literacy, financial literacy. Of course they get it. And 
I sat down with my younger daughter and said, you know, so what do you think when you think about your future and you think about what are you going to do and how are you going to support yourself? And she said, oh, I'm going to, don't worry, mom, I'm going to be a professional gymnast. <laughs> you know, and I said, you know, we're Jewish, right? Okay, so the chance of that actually happening is really, really small. So we need to, you know, regroup. Um, but, you know, I think um, one of the things that I find is Sheila, similar to what Sheila's saying, even if you teach your kid about their own responsibility, their own independence, um, living within their means, all of that, what was so scary about 08 is you can get sucked down in it even if you on your own level are being as responsible as you can be. I don't have a great answer for that. Um, so saving and you know that, that's the only protection that you're really gonna have is saving and understanding that and I, I try to teach them that. You know, we, we pay them 10% interest on their saving because to give them 0 .008 <laughs> doesn't really convey the message that you want to do. I have one kid who gets it. He wants to lever up and borrow from his grandma so he can put more in and get, you know, 10%. So I try, you know, to stifle that as well. It's, it's a fine line. Yeah, I'm not uh, introducing him to Dylan. I don't want him to get my 10-year-old to want to do the same thing. <laughs> He'll take that advice. Mel, it's the final word. I cannot top that. But <laughs> look, as an immigrant to America, I have to say this. I have boundless optimism about this country and the future of this country. And while I do get it, I understand how very, very ugly some of the short-term problems are. I think at the end of the day, when you look around the world, we are the strongest country economically by a bunch. We have an incredible uh, judicial system, which is the strongest anywhere in the world. People trust our economy. They trust to invest here. Uh, when you see young people like we saw here tonight, and, and the guy in the video, I mean, <laughs> he's, he's got great. a future. You know, there's a future Spielberg there. <laughs> Uh, you know, you've got to feel like somehow or another we're going to come through this and have faith in America because I honestly believe that over the next couple of years we could see a tremendous turnaround if the government has the fortitude to do the right thing. A significant if. Thank you. Thank you very much, all of you. Thank you for being here.